Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. We invite you to our website at ebiblefellowship.org for additional Bible studies. And now with his study in the Book of Romans, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible study in the book of Romans. Tonight is study number 26 of Romans chapter 1 and we're going to begin reading in verse 11. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. Now I would not have you ignorant, brethren, that oftentimes I purposed to come unto you, but was let hitherto, that I might have some fruit among you also, even as among other Gentiles. I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. And I'll stop reading there. Okay, um, we're looking at verse 11. Last time we uh, looked at the word long, and we saw that it was translated uh, long after or greatly desiring, expressing just that, a great desire. For I long to see you, and keep in mind, this has to do with Paul's journey to Rome, which we know spiritually identifies with the elect people of God coming out of the churches at the time of the end during the Great Tribulation. So that can account for this um, strong desire. For I long to see you, that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. The Apostle Paul, who's a pattern of the believers, is expressing this great desire within him that he must see them. These are the Romans. The Romans are those believers out in the world. And and so coming from Jerusalem is a picture of the elect coming out of the church, going out into the world. And we, we had a great desire to find the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to minister the word of God to all that we could, to share it far and wide, and then leave it to God to save whom he would save. And he did just that. And in that way, we were able to impart some spiritual gift to these chosen people that God had scattered amongst the nations of the earth. And that's uh, the overall spiritual picture, but we're going to look at the words a little closer. We looked at I long, uh, the word long, for I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Now the Greek word translated as impart is also found in Romans chapter 12. And I'll start reading from verse 5. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. And by the way, this word gifts, number 5486 in the Greek concordance, is the same word that's found back in our verse, Romans 1.11, uh, this desire that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift. Okay, uh, Romans 12, verse 6, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, and that's the word that's translated in part, uh, I-M-P-A-R-T, impart, 
He that imparteth, let him do it with simplicity. And then it continues with, with some other items. He that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. So in order to understand what God is saying here, we're going to have to understand simplicity. And, uh, you know, I acknowledge this is one of the words I wasn't too familiar with as far as its meaning. What does it mean? He that giveth or he that imparteth, let him do it with simplicity. Well, simplicity is translated a few different ways, and it is Strong's number 3330. Uh, and, and we're not going to look at them all, but it's translated simplicity, and it's also translated as bountifulness. If we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'll start reading in verse 6 through 8. The, the word won't be found in these verses, but it, it's necessary to read in order for, for us to understand um, a little further on in this same chapter uh, what, what it is pointing to. 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6 says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And by the way, that is a biblical principle that we should have full expectation of in the day of judgment. And what I mean is, leading up to judgment day, leading up to May 21, 2011, the word of God, the gospel, while it was still the day of salvation, was sowed bountifully like never before in the history of the world through the electronic medium, through a, a pure form of faithful delivery of the gospel, primarily through Family Radio, Mr. Camping's teachings, and it was shared far and wide. Bountiful sowing of the seed of the word of God. Well, where's the reaping? The reaping will take place at this time, God saved everyone to be saved. And over the course of these next few years, leading up to the conclusion of all things, according to the biblical evidence, which points to the year 2033, we can expect that great catch of fish, which John 21 tells us about, to be drawn. Bring of the fish that you have caught, was what Christ said after they had dragged or, or drew those fish to land. And, and then after a delay, there was the command to bring them, and they were drawn directly to Christ. And that's what we all should be encouraged by, that there is the principle. If there has been uh, abundant sowing, there can be an expectation of abundant reaping. Well, okay, uh, let's go on here. Verse 7, Every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. So we, we see in these verses, that the gospel's in view and the idea of abounding and bountiful and so forth is also in view. And then if we go down to verse 10, it says, Now he that ministers seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness, being enriched in everything to all bountifulness. And that's the word that's translated simplicity in uh, Romans 12. So being enriched in everything to all bountifulness, which causes through us thanksgiving to God for the administration of this service, 
not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God, whiles by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution. And the word liberal is the same word that was earlier in verse 11 translated bountifulness and and is also translated simplicity. So for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men and by their prayer for you which long after you, and that's the translation of the word long in the verse we're looking at in Romans that we discussed last time, um, and, and it goes on to say, which long after you for the exceeding grace of God in you, thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. And there is the gift that is ultimately in view with what we're reading in Romans 1. Although it's a different word. It's it's not the same Greek word. Well, uh, this helps us to see in the context of 2 Corinthians 9 that the bountifulness, the liberal distribution has to do with the gospel, with sowing the seed, uh, which would apply in the day of salvation, and with just sharing the truth of the word of God. And... And this is done unto them and unto all men, as it says there. Well, if we go back to Romans 1, verse 11, For I long to see you, for I greatly desire to see you, that I may impart or give unto you some spiritual gift. There, there is a great desire to uh, give bountifully, a liberal distribution of some spiritual gift. And the spiritual gift, well, first we have to just think about the word spiritual. The word spiritual is 4152, and it's, uh, well, I'll, I'll try to pronounce as best as I can, pneumaticon, pneumaticon, um, and it's from 4151 Numa, and 4151 is the typical word for spirit, ghost, as in Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. And it's also translated as life one time uh, in an odd place in Revelation 13 with the image of the beast and, and uh, the, the had power to give life unto the image and it's actually the word spirit, to give spirit unto the image of the beast. So spiritual, we can see, is related, derived from spirit. And of course, it's obvious that God is a spirit. The Bible's a spiritual book. And anything spiritual must come forth from the Spirit of God. God is the giver of spiritual things, especially once we understand because of man's sinful condition, his fall into sin back in the Garden of Eden, that God judged mankind and slew him in his spirit, causing him to die in his soul existence and to have a dead spirit within. So uh, a human being uh, created in the image of God, created good, created with a living spirit, became dead in their spiritual life. And therefore, because they're dead in spirit, they cannot have spiritual things. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to think that a spiritually dead sinner can possess spiritual attributes that, that come forth from the Spirit. And, and we do know from scriptures, such as in Galatians chapter 5, that God speaks of the fruit of the Spirit in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit 
is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. These are fruits of the Spirit. So they're spiritual fruits. There are spiritual characteristics and attributes that can only come forth from a spirit being. Someone who has life in the spirit can uh, impart spiritual things, such as God the Holy Spirit, who who's the essence of life and and is the fullness of everything spiritual. And, and that's the idea that the Apostle Paul is being moved to express as he's writing under inspiration of God. God breathed into the Word of God, the Bible, to make it quick and powerful. Quick, meaning alive and, and powerful in the spiritual realm. Because we know the Bible tells us that the law is spiritual. We read that. Also in the book of Romans, in chapter 7, verse 14, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The law of God, the Bible, and the law is the whole Bible, all the way through, all 66 books, every word, jot, and tittle, is spiritual and because it's spiritual, it's, it's alive in that realm of existence. It, it possesses power in the spirit. And power to do what? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God in the proper time and season, according to God's determination of when he would save and when he would stop saving within the uh, boundary of the day of salvation. God sent forth his word. The word was heard first with the physical ears of a person. And if they happen to be one of God's elect, chosen, predestinated before the foundation of the world, at some point, God would use his word to create a new heart and a new spirit in the soul. The dead soul of the sinner now has the seed sown from God himself. He's the sower. We're, we're just messengers and, and we're messengers of the gospel to carry out God's overall program. And, and Christ is the sower himself. It's his word. He is spirit. His word is spirit. And he sowed the seed upon dead hearts. Stony ground. Hard, stony, cold ground. The, the dead spiritual condition of man. And in a miraculous way, in the life of only those elect children, God sparked life and, and brought the dead soul back to uh, a living condition. It, it, there was a resurrection in the spiritual realm, in the soul, the spirit condition of these certain individuals. And then they came alive. They came alive. They maybe didn't even know it for a while. But they came alive and they began to hear the voice of Christ. What's it say in John 10? My sheep hear my voice. The, the people of God, they hear the voice of the good shepherd. And we are given ears to hear. Now we, we have ears, we have eyes in our head. We're able to stand up on our feet and walk in God's commandments. As Lazarus came forth out of the tomb, now we're able, we're given an ability to keep his commandments, to show forth love unto Christ who has granted us such grace and mercy. 
there's now spiritual activity, spiritual things are going on inside of these people that God has had mercy upon. And, and you see, this is all part of this great desire. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift, the gift of eternal life. It's the gift that's mentioned in Romans 6, the last verse in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That's, of course, the great desire. You, you, there can be no other uh, flowing forth of spiritual gifts without this first. There must be the gift of eternal life, the gift of salvation, the gift of grace, as God describes it in Ephesians chapter 2. In these wonderful verses, in Ephesians 2, verse 5, uh, well, I'll start reading in verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and has raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. This is the gift that Romans 6.23 is speaking of. And once we have this gift, we have everything. We, we do have everything we need. You know, we, we're constantly distracted by things of the world, by the world telling us you need this, you need that. Uh, hey, look over here, look over there. Wouldn't it be great to have that? And, and trying, attempting to prompt us to spark lust within us to have this thing and that thing. But all we need, all we need is God's salvation. Everything else is um, fine if God uh, wants to to uh, bestow it upon us or, or give us anything else. But all we truly need is that. And if we have that, we have everything we need. And, and so, um, going back to this verse again, that I may impart or give unto you some spiritual gift to the end ye may be established. And the word established is a word that's translated a, a couple of different ways. Uh, for example, in Luke 22... Verse 32, it's translated as strengthen. Luke 22, 32 says, But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Establish them. Establish them is what Christ is saying. Or in uh, Luke 16, Verse 26, it says, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed. And this is speaking of the rich man and Lazarus. Lazarus in Abraham's bosom, in the kingdom of God. The rich man in hell, or in the condition of death. And, and in between, a great gulf fixed. So that... You cannot go from where you are to where Lazarus is, and he cannot go from there to you. It's fixed. It's established. And, and that's the same word. Or in Romans 16, verse 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. And, and it goes on from there. One last verse, Second Peter 1, 
verse 12 says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. You were established in the word of God. Of course, one reason why it would say the present truth is because we understand the gospel to be the truth of the word of God in its proper time and season. In the Old Testament, it was God's truth. And in order to be faithful, you had to follow the ceremonial laws, the sacrificial laws, and so forth. Do we have to follow that now? No, it's not the present truth. In the time of the church age, it was uh, the law of God. It, and in order to be faithful to his word, we wanted to be part of a church and partake of the Lord's Supper and be baptized and have our children baptized. Do we do those things now? No, because the church age is over. It's not part of the present truth. These things have been fulfilled and and so on. Uh, it, it's a very interesting way of putting it. Established in the present truth according to God's proper time and season. The day of salvation was a present truth for its time period, which stretched many centuries. And we wanted to firmly stand for it and encourage people and be faithful in that teaching while it was active. But now the door is shut. The light of the gospel is out. The waters dried up and and all the other figures that the Bible uses. It's no longer the present truth because the season, the time has changed from the day of salvation to the day of judgment. Okay, if we go back to Romans 1.11, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end, ye may be established. The word end is really not in the text. To, for the purpose you may be established. That is, verse 12, that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith both of you and me. It's a very unusual verse. Why is it unusual? Because it, it speaks of being comforted together. So that has the idea of, uh, you know, two. Um, com comforted together with you by the mutual faith Mutual also conveys that same idea, your faith, my faith. The mutual faith, both, both is you, me, of you and me, which is saying the same thing. It's a, a very tremendous emphasis upon this idea of you and me. And we don't have time to get into it at this point, but it's just something we can think about before our next Bible study. You've been listening to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. Visit our website at ebiblefellowship.org for additional studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.